Hi everybody and welcome back to Different Leaf, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. We are back for our fall podcast season and we're excited to be covering lots of yummy stories about new trends in edibles, along with some super interesting cultural holiday connections with cannabis. You can check out our lineup of guests in the new fall issue of Different Leaf the magazine, which is all about marijuana edibles and is hitting the shelves at select retailers like Whole Foods and Barnes & Noble bookstores this weekend. Head on over to differentleaf.com where you can either order the new full edible issue mailed to you or find your nearest in-person retailer selling the magazine. That's differentleaf.com. This episode, we're marking the end of Hispanic Heritage Month with a conversation about marijuana and the Latinx community. Our guests today are Spencer Perón and Andrea Berrios, founders of Clio CBD and Delta 8 Gummies out of California. Andrea and Spencer started Clio after about a century of pot prohibition, during which time Hispanic communities in the US were heavily targeted by the war on drugs. Spencer and Andrea knew that education would be key to helping their community feel safe and prepared to access cannabis and CBD for wellness again. But they noticed a serious accessibility barrier. There was almost no marijuana-related education being created in Spanish, And there was also very few information sources for generations of Hispanic people to learn to trust new information about cannabis science so that they might feel comfortable exploring CBD or Delta 8 as legal wellness options. Now that's a problem in a lot of states like Texas, where hemp extracts such as CBD and Delta 8 are the only legal options people have for cannabinoids, and Spanish speakers are a growing population. Today, we're going to discuss everything from the generational differences in the views on weed within many Hispanic families to what new users should know before trying the so-called legal cannabinoids of CBD and Delta 8. We'll be back with Andrea and Spencer from Clio Gummies after this quick break. Andrea, let's start with you. What's your background and how did you get into the CBD space? Yeah, I actually think have a relatively different background to a lot of people that are in the cannabis space. I spent the last two years at business school where I met Spencer and then the five years before that working for a big management consulting firm, but I've been lifelong cannabis consumer, you know, first tried the plant when I was 15 and immediately knew this was something that's different. It's different than alcohol and at so many different points in my life. It's played a lot of different roles and usually part of my wellness routine. But growing up in Texas and then later I moved to Bogota, Colombia, you know, there was no real legal industry to speak of and I didn't really see myself in the cannabis industry. I was always interested in following what was happening and very closely watching all the companies that were coming into the space, but didn't really see a role for myself until I moved out to California. And it was just a very different market to see companies in the space marketing to people and selling products that were very accepted, not stigmatized, and had kind of a completely different way of speaking to the customer. And that really kind of got the gears turning, but it it was really after, you know, going through so many company about pages and not seeing leadership teams that looked like me or that were speaking to the community that I really cared about that, you know, really pushed me into getting my start in the industry. So I've been working on Clio for the last two years or so. Cool. And what about you, Spencer? You you guys met at business school? Yeah, we did. So Ironically, my roommate in business school, our first year, is now Andrea's partner and they're married. We met originally just through that connection and Cleo kind of blossomed from there. Going back, I'm originally from Minnesota and spent a lot of my schooling in in Wisconsin. So both pretty restrictive cannabis states. Had a lot of friends growing up who struggled with the law, were arrested for cannabis, which I luckily escaped, but saw that going on my entire childhood. And also then spent a few years at a consulting firm similar to Andrea, but along that time was working in the agriculture industry. And this is around the 2016, 2017 timeline when states were starting to legalize. And I was watching this whole industry burgeoning on the West Coast, but in Chicago, where I was living at the time, marijuana and cannabis was still very taboo, similar to the rest of the Midwest. But I was really interested in getting involved in the industry and saw it as a really important plant and just industry and movement to get behind and something really exciting to go and work with. And so then moved out to Santa Barbara, California, 
where I joined a vertically integrated uh, recreational THC company and then worked for a couple leading brands in the Santa Barbara area for about three years before going to business school. And in business school, you know, as I mentioned, I met Andrea. We were talking about starting a company and, and what we were seeing in the industry the whole time and saw a real opportunity to create something meaningful and lasting and differentiated with Clio. And that's ultimately how it was born. That's awesome. So you guys say business school, but what you leave out there is that it was Berkeley, right? Yeah. Yes. Go Bears. I'm a Berkeley grad too. <laughs> Go Bears. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. So when you guys were at business school together and you started sort of looking into the CBD market, was Delta 8 even a thing back then? Yeah, it was. And it didn't really come about from us, you know, looking at opportunities and seeing where we could play in the space. It kind of was born organically. We, I'm from Texas, Spence is from Minnesota. And over the winter holidays, we went to go visit our family and found out that our friends and family had been taking Delta 8 products that they were buying in gas stations and convenience stores because, you know, is this new product on the market and the effects that were promised were, you know, the effects that they were getting. And it was easier to get than, you know, however they were sourcing their cannabis before. And it bothered us that the only options for our friends and family that we cared so much about were these products that were popping up in, you know, gas stations, convenience stores and didn't have any real regulation around how they should be tested, how they should be labeled, you know, how the consistency should be from batch to batch. So we created better products that we would feel comfortable with them taking, knowing that, you know, if they were taking these products, other people in non-recreational THC markets were also looking for products that would help solve their pain, anxiety, sleeplessness, or, you know, even just as a substitute for alcohol. So in the states where it's not recreationally legal, I've heard the same thing. There's a lot of folks who are seeking out really good CBD and really good Delta 8, which is a byproduct of the CBD extraction process. And according to folks that have tried it, I've never tried it, but apparently it's got a little bit of a buzz to it. So it's sort of the best cannabinoid that you can get your hands on without having to go to the legacy market. When it comes to creating the actual gummies, where did you guys start that process? Did you have a background in any kind of culinary science? I would say in, in culinary science, no, but in vertically integrated cannabis supply chains, yes. And so we really tried to draw from my background experience here in California and the regulated market and just what we had seen in California and other regulated markets for years and to create a product that had all of the consistency, lamp testing, quality that one would find in a Delta 9 THC gummy here in California and then bring that premium product to our friends and family in non-recreational states. And so to your point, Delta 8 is really a, a pretty direct substitute for Delta 9 THC. Mm -hmm. A lot of people report that it gives them a little less of a heady high, a little more body high, and can be less anxiety producing. But for all of our friends and family, they see it as an absolute direct substitute. And so we feel like we're able to deliver the best of California cannabis wellness to friends and family back in Texas and Minnesota now. So you guys are based in California and all of your products are coming from the California market. Are you using hemp or are you using medical marijuana with high CBD? How do you do this? Yeah, everything's all hemp derived. So we're using only federally legal cannabinoids with the goal of expanding access nationwide. And so at this point, we've shipped to 28 different states and have really discovered consumers and aficionados across the U.S. and in geographies that we weren't even considering originally. So let's talk about the Latinx community when it comes to cannabis. This episode's going to be coming out right at the tail end of Hispanic Heritage Month. So let's talk about the history that you guys personally have with CBD and marijuana and then what your family's take was on you guys entering the cannabis industry. Obviously, your families were trying to access Delta 9 and CBD, and that's sort of the reason behind your getting into to this industry. What were your family histories when it comes to cannabis? So I come from a Nicaraguan immigrant family, first generation American. As far as my parents and grandparents generation goes, you know, the stigma against cannabis is very real. It's in, when you look at the history of cannabis in the United States and the criminalization of cannabis, even marijuana, the term most commonly associated with the psychoactive aspect of cannabis, a lot of that comes from a lot of stereotyping and criminalization that had to do with the Latino community. And it's, I mean, it's very pervasive and it's not something that's openly talked about. My generation, my cousin's generation, everyone is very cannabis friendly. I mean, everyone has kind of tried the plant and 
it's a very different reaction to it, but there still is that stigma. I guess taking it back to when I first tried cannabis as a teenager, you know, it's been 15 years or so now, and it was up until the last six months, something that I had to keep completely secret from my parents. I never talked about it with them. It was not something that I was open with them about. Um, and even starting this business, you know, I was kind of waiting for it to get a little bit more traction before I came out to them and told them that I've been consuming cannabis my whole life. It's really helped me. I think it could help you too. And I'm going to be public with my cannabis use, which is something that I think is still very scary for them. But, you know, as I approached my 30s and I saw lots of my friends' relationship with their parents and cannabis consumption start to change, and I kind of wanted that for myself and thinking about, you know, maybe the way that I could have the most impact and the way that I could get that conversation started was by just creating better cannabis education in Spanish. Mm -hmm. When we first started this business, it's a whole new vocabulary for me to talk about cannabis in Spanish. They're just, you know, words that aren't commonly used. And especially when it's used, you're something that you're used to keeping hidden from your family and my family is who I speak Spanish to the most. You know, it's just not in my vocabulary. So I was looking for different articles related to cannabis to see how they kind of talked about it and the terms that they used. And it was really hard to find information in Spanish for cannabis, CBD. There were general articles, but when it came to Delta 8 or other hemp-derived cannabinoids or other more specific topics with cannabis, there was almost nothing on the internet. I mean, you could probably search Delta 8 right now with a Spanish language term and the majority of the hits that you're going to get are going to be in English. Wow. And so the first step in Clio was changing the language accessibility barrier there. So we made the website fully available in Spanish, which includes not only the shopping aspects, but also all of the key, you know, educational pieces so that we can start to get the conversation rolling. Yeah, in the last 15 years that I've been consuming in the United States, I've never really seen any cannabis advertisement, education, or anything, you know, outside of searching for it on the internet in Spanish. Let me ask where you started when you said that you haven't even told your family until just six months ago that you were involved in this. Where do you start with the conversation with stigma that surrounds the plant and the fact that you're now getting into it? You know, I didn't give them the opportunity to even process the fact that, you know, we are working in cannabis. You know, I've been working on this business. Things are going really well. I'm really excited about it. People are responding really well to it. People are writing in and giving us comments on how this has helped with their sleep. This has helped with their anxiety. You know, this has helped them start to take less pharmaceuticals. And then I told them that it was cannabis. And then the conversation was a little bit different. What was their reaction? (laughs) I think at first they didn't really fully understand what I was doing because in their minds, you know, they've only ever seen cannabis as a smokable herb and they don't, you know, they haven't heard of edibles. They haven't heard of tinctures. They haven't heard of topicals. And so Knowing that we made edible gummy products, I think it abstracted a little bit what it was. Ultimately, they came around to it and their main questions were, you know, is this illegal? Are you going to get in trouble for this? Is this something that we should be worried about? And, you know, the answer to all those questions is is no. And so I think that that gave them a lot of comfort and finally opened their minds to the idea of cannabis and still trying to get them to take some of our products that they're less familiar with and less comfortable with, but, you know, one step at a time. Yeah, definitely. Spencer, how about you? What was your family's connection to cannabis, if any? I would say a little different than than Andrea's, but for me, it was kind of one of the most pleasantly surprising journeys of, of my life. So I was raised in what I thought was a, a pretty conservative Catholic household. Uh, my parents really don't drink it much, seem to be very anti anything drinking or imbibing to alter one's one's state of consciousness. So I was very worried when I was younger to bring cannabis up to them and really just kept that whole part of my life hidden. But it was really only when I was looking to leave consulting and, and join the cannabis industry back in 2018 that I shared with them that's what I was interested in doing and that I had joined a cannabis company. And they were really supportive and seemed extremely interested. One of the most shockingly joyous moments of my life was bringing back some products to my family and sharing a vape pen with my mom and dad in in our living room and just really opening up that whole side to our family that I didn't know about. And since then, I mean, they've been huge supporters of Clio and they're both retired and so i think they enjoy cannabis occasionally not in the herb sense but with edibles and topicals and and other solutions i think Mm. it's a really great testament to the fact that everyone can find something that works for them in this industry and at least within our family it's been a great way to bring each other together and just speaks to the community and wellness aspect of cannabis it's been a really pleasantly surprising journey for me 
That's nice to hear. When it comes to talking to, I think, any older generation, a lot of the time there's that stigma because they all grew up with a very different government to us and a very different culture to us especially as teenagers, sometimes in the 60s and 70s. But when it comes to the Hispanic community, it seems to be the disconnect from what was formerly seen as medicine in that culture. And then, of course, as you mentioned earlier, Andrea, the war on drugs, and it's really rooted in the racism connected to Mexican immigrants. Where do you really start when you're trying to form a cannabis company that makes sure that these marginalized folks who have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, feel comfortable trying cannabis again. And like you said, don't worry that they're going to get in trouble with the law. They can get access online when they want to find information. Mm -hmm. How can other cannabis companies more readily open up to that community? I think there, you know, is no one magic bullet, but a couple of things that come to mind is, first of all, accessibility and advertising that is in the language that makes the most sense for that community and that gets to you know, the most important issues around the education. I think that's just table stakes. It's like making sure people can read your content, access it, they know how it's going to make them feel, et cetera. I'd say the other thing is just being present and having a leadership team that looks like the community that they're trying to represent. I think it's really common to see in cannabis advocacy towards a particular issue or, you know, throwing money behind a particular issue or trying to highlight a certain group during a certain month, et cetera. But it makes a much bigger difference, I think, when the leadership team represents the community that they're actually trying to speak to. I think there is a lot of distrust, you know, not speaking for the entire Latino community, but I think whenever you see an executive who's out there telling you that there's this new product that you can try and it will make you feel better and it's legal, don't worry. I think there's always that instinct of maybe not trusting this person. Do they have my best interests in mind? And when it comes from someone who looks like you, who cares about you, who comes from your community, it has a much bigger impact, I think. And Mm -hmm. so I think reaching the community Obviously, the first step is just to be visible, but the second step is to make sure that your roots actually show that you care about the community and that it's not something that you're doing for business interests. So you said there were 28 states that you're shipping to at the moment. How many folks in those states are interested in reading the information and directions about how to use CBD and and Delta-8 in Spanish versus English? Right now, the vast majority is in English. I mean, we're laying the groundwork for Spanish and exciting that this is coming out around Hispanic Heritage Month. We are currently translating or mirroring all of our social media into Spanish and setting up a way to consistently create content in Spanish that's differentiated from our English language content. You know, awareness is going to be the name of the game. We're a small company and we're a small team and we have to focus our efforts somewhere. So, you know, we haven't gone out and raised as much awareness about our language inclusion as I would like, hoping for that to start to change. It's very encouraging, though, that whenever we talk to, you know, other Latinos, either thinking about talking to their parents about cannabis or reflecting on their experiences with cannabis or other Latinos in the industry, once we tell them what we're working on, they start to kind of immediately get it and we do get that positive feedback that this is something that's needed. It's a a slow process, I think, to start to grow in the hearts and minds of our customers. For sure. What about the reaction that people have had to the products like in places like Texas and Minnesota, where you guys are from, where they don't have legal dispensaries? What are people saying about CBD and Delta 8? Why do they turn to it? I think part of the reason they're turning to it is is because it is a legal alternative that is accessible for them in those markets, particularly with Delta 8 and for people who want to consume cannabis and get to an elevated mind state, Delta 8 is is really the the best option for them. In general, I think we've been pleasantly, not surprised, but but have been very receptive of, of all the feedback that we've gotten. I and mean, it seems that the customers do love the products. Probably the biggest use case we've heard from customers is to help with sleep. Surprisingly to us, that's been across all three of our SKUs from a sole CBD product all the way to a, a high Delta 8 product. Wow. And so it's clear to us that everybody is different and every user is finding the right cannabinoid mix that works with their body and, and helps them get to their desired end state. Yeah, we've been very appreciative of, of all the feedback we've gotten so far. So you guys have three products and one of them is fully CBD, one of them is fully Delta-8, and then the other one is a mix of the two. 
And you said that folks are using all three and finding that all three of them help with sleep. How do you know which one you want to use if any one of them could make you feel sleepy? That was one of our most interesting findings. And when we started the company, you know, I, I kind of had the assumption that if someone was taking our CBD only product, they were probably using it for sleep or for rest. And if someone was taking our Delta 8 product, it's because they wanted to feel that buzz. And it wasn't until we started calling our repeat customers and asking them, you know, how do you incorporate your favorite Clio product? as part of your routine, like how, what does this product help you with, that we learned that across the board doesn't matter if it's the highest, most psychoactive product or the least psychoactive product, people seem to be able to use it for sleep. I think everybody's, and you know, part of what makes cannabis very exciting, but you know, also creates a big burden of education is that everybody's body is different and everybody's endocannabinoid system will respond to cannabis in a very different way. And so what works for one person, which might be 20 milligrams of Delta-8 might not work for another person and it might create a reaction that they very much don't want to be feeling at the time that they're trying to go to bed. Mm. The way that we are trying to get around that is by immediately trying to find out as soon as we acquire a new customer relationship, be it through our newsletter or, you know, someone makes a purchase. We try to immediately find out what they're hoping to get out of the product so that we can then guide them towards the best educational materials. And so in the case of using the product for sleep, we try to show them there is no one way to use this product for sleep. This is why the products work on your body. So a little intro to the endocannabinoid system. And then here are some real examples from real customers on how they use the product for sleep, showing that some people use the CBD only product. Some people use the blended product. Some people use the Delta only product. And even within those products, people get creative on the dosages. You know, some people will take two of the gummies. Some people will split the gummy in half. Some people will take it an hour before bed or two hours before bed. And so we really try to set the expectation that finding the right routine for you is going to require a little bit of trial and error. And you know, ultimately, it's we think it's worthwhile. But yeah, I guess it's up for the for the consumer to decide how they run with it. It's really interesting that you note that like the education materials are such an important part of this because it is a very much a trial and error thing. And I think that it's all about communicating really well with your customer base. And, and whenever I get people reaching out to me to ask me about how should I start dosing myself, it's really about communicating to them that they have to go slow, go low, go slow. You have to feel yeah. through how every experience feels. And then maybe add a little bit more or, and it's a very slow progress. And I think that if you don't have that education up front, you're going to do something like take too much or something that puts you off the product altogether. So it's really, really important that when you're first trying cannabis, whether you're starting on the light stuff like CBD and Delta 8, or you want to try something like THC, that you get really good information before you try any of your products, before you smoke, before you're taking edibles. Definitely before you dab. Oh, my God, if you're dabbing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get a how-to before you do the tough stuff. Yes, absolutely. But ev even with CBD, I tell folks to just take a little bit and then rest and see how that makes you feel and then see if you can take a walk without it making your heart go too fast or something. So for really, for everybody, it's a little bit different. And there's also sometimes some medications that you don't want to mix with CBD as well, things that mm -hmm. you're told not to mix grapefruit juice with. Most yeah. of the time they say don't mix with CBD, right? Is there any other educational tidbits that our new users should know about trying CBD or Delta 8? I think for CBD, maybe the most overlooked piece of information and what has ultimately helped us better set expectations and get people to a routine that works for them is the onboarding period of, you know, letting CBD build up in your system and, and seeing results after one week and not necessarily after one time mm. and also not placing unrealistic expectations, especially on CBD. It's not going to 100% take your pain away. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it will take the edge off, you know, and it, it definitely will help, but it's not going to be 100%, which I think is maybe where some people's minds are at when they take a CBD pill or a CBD gummy capsule, whatever, and are, are expecting a complete panacea. I think the other thing that's been really interesting, especially, you know, being in the hemp derived space is at first a lot of the education around Delta 8 or the content around Delta 8 was this is diet weed or this is light weed or this is the best cannabinoid people can get in Texas and that's <laughs> why people are taking it not for any inherent properties of the Delta 8 itself. Mm. But what we found from personal experience and also from talking to our customers is that the Delta 8 effect is a differentiated effect versus the Delta 9 effect that people are most used to. 
it's more of a body high as opposed to a head high. And for a lot of people, that can be the effect that they're looking for. For myself, I take Delta 9 edibles and I take our Delta 8 edibles all the time, just depending on what I want to get out of it. I think there are also other common examples like CBG or CBN and how do those compare to CBD? You know, excited about the way that education is going to move in the space more towards the functional effects of the different cannabinoids and how they interact on your body and less so about it being like, oh, this is the best people could get. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely benefits to the, every cannabinoid. We may not know what they are yet, but we're learning and I'm very excited to try some CBD and Delta 8 gummies. I've never tried Delta 8 before, but I've heard really good things from the folks that use them regularly. I think probably one of the best things that I find for taking a tolerance break for myself, because I'm a daily THC smoker, is to switch to CBD flower or to CBD gummies. And that just sort of helps me take a little bit of time off as well. So there's many uses for CBD products. And I love to find a company that not only makes great products, but also has great missions behind them. So I appreciate you guys coming on the show. And, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Love, love for to get you some us. products to try in the future. Oh, awesome. Can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> A huge thanks to today's guests, Spencer Perone and Andrea Berrios, founders of Clio CBD and Delta 8 Gummies. You can find out more about their products at yourfriendclio.com. Next week, we'll be talking to cannabis chef and author Robin Griggs Lawrence to get all the top tips for new cooks who are trying to learn how to infuse their own masterpiece meals at home. I read about in your article in the magazine that a lot of folks will clean their bud before they cook with it. I didn't know about this. How do you do it and why do you do it? This was life changing for me too. This Jeff the 420 chef told me this many years ago and he said, you clean your vegetables and your fruits. And I was like, yeah, I do. And then oh, you realize, yeah. yeah. And when you clean it, you realize, oh God, like I really should be doing this. So put it into simmering water for about five minutes so then put it into an ice bath. Put my bud, put my cannabis. It's not water soluble. It's not going to pull any of the goodies out of it. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening now so you don't miss out on next week's episode. And make sure you're following us on social media at Different Leaf and at Different underscore Leaf. And I'm on social media at Brit the British. Remember, head on over to differentleaf.com to order the new full edibles magazine issue mailed directly to you, or you can go to the subscribe and shop tab to find the nearest in-person retailer selling Different Leaf in person. That's differentleaf.com. Different